I guess it's like all things, all life stages, you know, whether it's having children or going through menopause or doing high school exams, you know, you don't pay much attention to the niceties of it until you're right in the sticky end of things. And suddenly it's like, oh my God, how do you do this? And it really feels that nobody's really been talking about it and you're not really sure how to approach these things. Hi, I'm Julia Halperin, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News, where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. A brand new publication penned by the London-based critic and Artnet contributor Hetty Judah is trying to tear down a dusty old myth that hangs around the art world, that artists can't be parents and be successful. With her new book published last week called How Not to Exclude Artist Mothers and Other Parents, Judah tries to capture the ways in which mothers, fathers, and other guardians have historically been excluded from the various realms of the art world. She interviewed scores of international artists to build a full and complex picture of this significant issue, which remains a problem in nearly every sector of the industry. How Not to Exclude Artist Mothers and Other Parents traces the history of the domestic and artistic pursuits, the pain points that endure, and the success stories that may offer workable ways forward. To crack open this important book and the issue it interrogates, Judah spoke with our Europe editor, Kate Brown. Welcome on the Art Angle, Hetty. It's so nice to have you here. Fantastic to be here, Kate. Thank you so much for taking an interest in the book. Definitely. Well, I've been aware of your writing about the subject of art and motherhood for several years now, which we all well know remains a very niche and underreported subject in the art industry. I recall hungrily searching for books when I became a parent about the creative field and motherhood, and I ended up having to order a secondhand book of Moira Davies' Mother Reader, which was out of print since 2001. So suffice to say, I was incredibly excited to hear about your new book, and I'd love to hear about what spawned your interest in this area in particular and why you were motivated to write a practical, no-nonsense guide to this subject. Well, I mean, part of it, as it happens, was stimulated by that fantastic report that Artnet and Charlotte Burns did a few years ago looking into the gender equality in the art world. I mean, that was a particularly fantastic bit of research and I have huge respect for their work in general. But that was one of a few studies that were done around that time looking at gender in the art world and the gender balance. And one of the things that really kind of came out quite strongly both in that report and in the Freelands Foundation reports in the UK, which kind of were running around the same time for about five years, was that there were about the same number of male and female students at art school. There were about the same number of male and female artists getting early career awards. And then somehow, suddenly when it got to the point of gallery representation, things just went all awry and men's careers flourished and women's careers quite often floundered. And that kind of moment of the parting of the fortunes seemed to happen really around, you know, like the kind of mid-30s. And I became interested really in the kind of unseen factors in the data. And I was thinking about kind of what might also be happening. Obviously, we love to point out structural sexism and that kind of thing, but what other things might be going on? And of course, one thing that quite often does happen to people in their 30s is they start a family. So I was interested to talk to artists about what impact motherhood had on their career. So I was initially commissioned just to write a short essay for the Freelance Foundation a couple of years ago, which ended up being called Full, Messy and Beautiful. And because the commission came just before the pandemic, and then I started writing the essay when the pandemic had happened and everyone was in lockdown, stuck at home, I kind of took a slightly more liberal approach to the interviews. And so I put an open call out on social media and I had a huge, huge response. So everybody that replied, I was like, okay, I'm going to interview them because I've got a lot of spare time right now. So I ended up doing, I think, over 50 interviews at that point. And they were pretty comprehensive. I mean, I've got about 500 pages of research just from that. I'm really talking to artists of all different backgrounds and all different stages in their careers about the impact that motherhood had. And some of them were people who had just recently found out they were pregnant and were experiencing sudden silence on the parts of curators with whom they'd previously had really important commissioning relationships. Some of them were grandmothers. Some of them were in the midst of having to look after very young children. So having done that initial bit of research... I then worked trying to kind of find solutions to try and kind of ameliorate the situation. So the first thing I did was work with about 30 artists on a manifesto called How Not to Exclude Artist Parents. And that came out at the beginning of 2021. 
And then this book really builds on the findings of the study and it looks at artists and organisations around the world who are really shifting the paradigm, who are presenting different ways that we might approach and deal with many of the structural issues that exist that make life really difficult for artist mothers and parents and others with caregiving responsibilities. In the book, it's structured, it sort of tackles each of these individual spheres that an artist will encounter throughout their career. So there's the institution, galleries, I'm interested to know, like, what were some of the prevailing trends that you observed through those 50 conversations? Like, what really stuck out for you? I mean, there are really obvious things about the art world that make things difficult. We all have this kind of private view system where we network and get to know one another and meet curators and meet collectors kind of between the hours of six and eight. And obviously, if you've got young children, that's incredibly difficult, even more so if you're a single parent. But weirdly, It was often subtler things like people feeling that they really couldn't confess to having children, confess to having a family. They felt very lonely and isolated quite often. They felt that there was no one else out there that had been through the same experiences. And it was really interesting that you talking about trying to find a copy of Mara Davies' book. I guess it's like all things, all life stages, you know, whether it's having children or going through menopause or doing high school exams, you know, you don't pay much attention to the niceties of it until you're right in the sticky end of things. And suddenly it's like, my God, how do you do this? And it really feels that nobody's really been talking about it and you're not really sure how to approach these things. And so oddly enough, things like loneliness and isolation, feeling that there wasn't a kind of forum for discussing what it meant to be both an artist and a parent, were quite prevalent. And then really feeling quite excluded from lots of things and invisible and like you weren't really kind of welcomed into the general discourse of the art world. It's quite often it's those kind of subtler issues that were really quite prevalent. It's interesting to hear you say that because one of the things I wanted to ask you was why you focused on artists in particular. Of course, these issues affect every worker in the art world. Of course, curators, dealers, art critics like yourself, I can imagine, must experience it. But is there something about the artist's existence that feels particularly precarious from your observations? Well, I mean, it absolutely is because obviously it's non-salaried work. I mean, the closest equivalent you could find is something like a zero hours contract, but a zero hours contract in which your value as a worker is attached to this kind of aura of cool and desirability and, you know, is seen as somebody that's producing exciting work. There is this thing where people also feel that an artist's career takes a certain, and this is super fake and very manufactured way of looking at an artist's career, but this idea that you, you know, you emerge as an artist and then your perceived value as an artist kind of increases and increases up to the point where you become established and then everybody wants a piece of you. And of course, nobody's career really happens like that. And we all have ups and downs. But I think there's so much value attached to kind of weird, intangible stuff in the art world, like buzz or image, and just even presence as well. And that becomes quite difficult to weigh up around having to participate in being a kind of active parent. I should say, just as a kind of a follow-up to your question, I am actually working with Joe Harrison, who has a project called Repronomics. And this weekend, we're launching something in the UK, but which I think is eminently reproducible in all territories, called the Art Working Parents Alliance, which is not for artists. It's for exactly those figures in the art world that you mentioned earlier. So it is the curators, the critics, the art handlers, the technicians, the gallerists. Because I think, as you say, absolutely so much of the kind of structural problematics of the art world affect all of us. And it's really, first of all, going to be a kind of social and mutually supportive network. But also through that, there'll be a slightly informal kind of mentoring going on and a kind of platform for discussing some of the problems that affect many of us. I mean, Kate, as a parent, you'll know that the travel that we're expected to do in the art world becomes really tricky, particularly if you're a single parent. And there's an expectation that you're going to be present at all of the biennials, all of the art fairs. And if you're not doing that, the supposition is that you're somehow not committed rather than that you're trying to maintain some kind of work-life balance. I mean, God forbid you maintain work-life balance in the art world, you know. (laughs) So with the Art Working Parents Alliance, we're going to start off with this more of a kind of informal network and kind of social meetups and a bit of mentoring. And then we're going to work towards a symposium next year where we're going to discuss whether there are things that we specifically want to tackle. And that could be giving people the tools to negotiate maternity leave which at the moment I think there's not a kind of industry standard for that in galleries or how to put together budget lines that might encompass having some kind of childcare, God forbid, or the sustainability of all of this travel that we're all doing. Not simply sustainability from an environmental perspective, but also sustainability from a kind of career perspective as well. 
Oh, that sounds like it's going to be so vital because I was really captivated by this one line in your book, the art world has no HR department. And I think that it seems very foggy right now to try to imagine what sort of standards we could create. But as we well know from a slightly different issue, but like the GCC, for example, they've created really concrete ways that people can measure their progress when it comes to like being more climate friendly. Is that sort of the goal of the alliance to really create these measurable goals that people can sign up for? Hey, it's early days yet, Kate. So we're just launching this weekend. (laughs) And I think as with many of the enterprises that I've been involved in in this field, I'm really interested in it being polyvocal. And rather than me applying what I think should happen is kind of working out what actually would be useful for people and perhaps also what's kind of achievable So I think with the Gallery Climate Coalition, I think because you're talking about statistics and facts and figures that your environmental impact is quite quantifiable. With this, it's going to be, I think, perhaps more to do with establishing best practice that people can ask for and also to give people tools they can use to negotiate or paradigms that they can offer to their employer, whether that's a commercial gallery or an institution to say, these are the guidelines, this is actually what's recommended, or how about we do it this way? So I don't think you can necessarily have a quantifiable scale in the same way that you can with measuring climate impact. But the idea is that you certainly establish best practice. Right. I guess I was thinking that there can just be ways to bake in a child care fee and what that should be and what the like minimum wage is and how these can be added into grant applications or included in a talk fee, right? Yeah. I mean, that kind of thing, I think, is more something we're going to have to discuss with, for example, grant giving organisations like the Arts Council in, Mm. in England. It's maybe more giving tools to people that are actually working in the art world as academics and trying to make sure the fact that their parents doesn't mean that they're always at the kind of most precarious employment end of things as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it's all up for grabs. I mean, let's see how it goes. Ask me in a year's time. <laughs> I wanted to sort of pivot to something a bit more personal. Throughout the book, you have incredibly poignant and incredibly relevant anecdotes from over 50 different artists that you spoke to. I wanted to ask you, are you a parent and how have you experienced this kind of issue yourself in the art world, if you have? So I am a parent. I'm kind of at the um, far end of it at the moment. So my kids are 20 and the old one's about to turn 22. It's absolutely had an impact because I was working on the editorial team of a magazine and I was there as a single parent and I was very much unable to, for example, travel. I was unable to participate in kind of the after hours side of the art world. So I couldn't go to private views. I wasn't going to gallery dinners. And I absolutely saw my career going from a point where I'd started the magazine as a columnist. So I had some cachet and essentially by the end of it, I was just an office worker kind of doing quite basic line editing. Whereas my younger colleagues were getting much more prestigious invitations. They were essentially advancing, whereas I was slipping back. You know, it has a massive impact. And I was only really able to participate in the art world as we kind of understand it, that kind of the more international side of the art world, the social aspect of the art world. Really, when my kids were a bit older and I had a relationship with somebody that could share the childcare more with me. So that's really only been like in the last, let's say, seven years. Wow. It's interesting to hear because I think in recent years, you know, the art industry has made definite strides in terms of being more aware of invisible accessibility issues like the one you just described from your own account personally. But I've noticed that in some ways motherhood is considered differently from other accessibility issues because it's kind of seen as a choice. And I wonder what you think about this kind of categorization. Do you think that motherhood and the accessibility issues around it are being ignored or there's more progress to be made as compared to other accessibility issues in the art world? Well, absolutely. I think the reason that motherhood kind of is ignored is because it's seen as a women's issue and it's like it's a woman's choice but the point is to make it really easy to be a parent in the art world and then it can become a societal issue because if it's easy to be a parent in the art world then we can move towards having equal child care shared care at the moment it's very much weighted towards women having to do most of the child care because there's still a gender pay gap and so usually if there is a couple and they're heterosexual it will be the mother who ends up doing most of the childcare because she'll be getting paid less. And we have a gender pay gap in the art world as well. Huge gender pay gap, as many of these studies have pointed out. And that's a gender pay gap also that affects things like academic positions as well. So I think my end goal with this is to actually kind of move towards making the art world a place where shared care is really easy. 
that we can really talk about artist parents because as an artist father, you can also ask for, or you can also expect that kind of support when you're kind of talking to a gallery or talking to an institution about the fact that you have caring responsibilities. Mm -hmm. This is an intersectional issue, right? That meets questions of race and class and wealth and geographic location and all these kinds of limitations that exist in the art world, these different sorts of ceilings. Absolutely. And I think it also, as you say, it's quite different depending also on where you're based as well. There are certainly, I guess, territories in the art world where it's much more normal for people to have, for example, full-on childcare and domestic assistance. I mean, I had a friend who had a gallery in Hong Kong and she said, oh, loads of the gallerists in Hong Kong are women. And it was because everybody had domestic servants. And I guess in the equivalent kind of, well, I mean, I can't necessarily talk with that much authority, but I think it's much more common in certain parts of the art world, in certain geographies to have, you know, for example, extended family who can help out looking after kids. Mm -hmm. You know, so there are going to be different kinds of cultural things going on in terms of childcare as well. But no, it's absolutely a kind of intersectional issue because I think if you don't have the wherewithal to pay for childcare, if you don't have family nearby, if you have children that have extra care needs, if you're a single parent, it'll have a different impact on you as well. Speaking about flows of wealth in your chapter on galleries, you brought something up that I thought was super interesting, which is that significant amount of contemporary collectors are women and of childbearing age. Can you speak a bit about how this observation intersects with some of your considerations around artist mothers? So one of the things that I talk about quite a bit in the book is that actually the big paradigm shift that we need to have in the art world is to take into consideration that an artist might also be a mother. Because at the moment, what's seen as the norm for artists is that an artist is just going to be a kind of carefree man without caring responsibilities. So to normalize the idea that an artist might also be a mother. And in the chapter you're talking about, I was looking at commercial representation and talking about why galleries should be interested in artist mothers and accommodating them. And one thing that occurred to me was that actually the collective base at the moment might well be interested in motherhood as a subject and as a state because a collector can also be a mother. So it's not simply the fact that an artist may also be a mother, but a collector may also be a mother. I think museums are shifting a bit, but very much the old idea with museums is the average museum visitor was going to be a guy, Mm -hmm. a white guy, in fact. So why would they be interested in art by people of colour or art by women? And that paradigm has now definitely shifted where there's an understanding among museums that actually there's a potentially a very diverse audience for art if you provide for them. And I think we can think about that in terms of the commercial sector as well, that there's a very diverse collector base out there if you're catering for them. And that might also encompass collectors that are interested in maternity as a subject. Right. But also maternity as a fact of an artist's career, like you said, through the ebbs and flows. Just to clarify, I know from having read the book that you don't simply mean artists that are making work about motherhood. Like it doesn't mean that a collector who's a mother is just interested in motherhood as an artistic subject, right? Can you speak a bit about artists who are making work about this issue and then the actualities of these issues? Because they are sort of overlapping, but then they also need to be disentangled. No, absolutely. And I mean, artists are incredibly varied. They have very varied concerns. (laughs) And artist parents have very varied concerns. They've got absolutely different ideas about the way that they might want to approach things. And just because you're an artist mother doesn't mean you make work about motherhood. But I did want to also tackle that because I think that it's seen as being a bit of a kind of taboo subject. It is shifting a little bit, and it's certainly shifted a bit in the last few years, notably through the work of people like Tala Madani and Camille Rowe and Caroline Walker. One of the things when we're talking about the idea that a collector might also be a mother is thinking outside of the 6 to 8 p.m. private views and dinner paradigm, so that you'd be accommodating people that might want to, for example, meet at brunch and bring their children to the gallery, because the weekend is when they get to hang out with their children. In terms of an artist's career shape, I mean, one thing that was really interesting was chatting with Pilar Corius, who's a gallerist here in London, who has quite a notably artist mother heavy roster. She's got two spaces in London. She's a pretty big player and she's got some really, really fantastic artists in her stable, including Tala Madani, actually. And I talked to her about how you accommodate artist mothers as a gallerist. A lot of it comes down to the kind of basic stuff that I talk about throughout the book, where a lot of this is just bothering to think and ask people questions and 
and having conversations with people about what they need. And it doesn't involve a huge amount more expense. But I mean, for example, you know, really simple things like if you're traveling with kids, it might suit an artist better to be in an Airbnb than a hotel, quite small things. Having the respect not to call someone at the weekend or after a certain time in the evening because they're with their kids. But she also said that if you're a good gallerist, you're with an artist for the long term, you're supporting the artist and nurturing their career, taking the long view of it. So in fact, the years when an artist is really going to have to be quite absent in terms of childcare, you know, those really early years where you're breastfeeding and having to deal with quite young children, the context of an artist's career is really short. So if you're taking a proper long view of an artist's career, then it's not going to have a massive impact. But I think what's extraordinary is if you look at the work that Kate McMillan's been doing, looking into the representation of female artists, overwhelmingly the gallerists that have kind of sticky issues about representing women, one of their big concerns is that the artist is going to start a family and then kind of disappear for a bit. And that's even with artists that have no interest in starting a family, but it becomes a kind of prejudice against taking on women artists as a gallerist. So, I mean, I think encouraging this kind of long view, but also encouraging the fact that perhaps you're going to need to give a little bit of extra support, but it's more to do with just having a conversation with the artist and mm-hmm. knowing what they need, because they might be absolutely desperate for time away from their child. They might be really desperate to get back into the studio. They might feel really inspired to make a new body of work. And it's really more a conversation with people about what their needs are and how you can accommodate them. And it really might be quite easy. It might just require like a little bit of flexibility working out when you're going to time their shows to accommodate, for example, time they need off while they're nursing or something like that. It's not necessarily like massive seismic shifts. Yeah. And as you said, and in some cases, childbearing and child rearing can be very transformative for the creative process. I'm curious because in your book, you sort of debunk the supposed asymmetry between motherhood and being creative. What were sort of general trends that you noticed in your conversations with artists? Like how did motherhood affect their creative process specifically? It's so diverse, Kate. I mean, there are some artists who really wanted to dive deep into exploring maternity as a state and who wanted to collaborate with their children. So at the moment, I mean, you may have heard some drilling going on in the background, but to coincide with the launch of the book this week, we're doing like a mini festival at TJ Bolton Gallery in London. And so I've got 41 artists participating in the show and so I'm hanging 38 works downstairs and then there are three performances going on there's a kind of variety of works in which the artist has literally collaborated with their kid on the canvas and so they've drawn like a figure and the kid's done the face there are works which involve the child as a subject in the work but then there are completely abstract works as well it's so varied so there are some people that feel tremendously inspired to start investigating this. There are some people that continue to do the same kind of abstract work that they've always done. And then there are also people that kind of feel like they have this drive where they need to keep producing and not change anything. And they also end up burning out, you know, so it does have a negative impact on people's careers as well. Some people feel energized, some people don't accommodate perhaps their own need to have kind of a bit of balance. So it has a completely varied impact on people's work, you know, in the same way that I presume it does on artist fathers if they're in a kind of caregiving position as well. Actually, yeah, I wanted to ask you that. Why did you go with artist mothers as a focal point and not collapse the term into parent or guardian? The title does have and other parents. And as I Mm -hmm. say in the introduction to the book, there are more people held in the parentheses than there are outside of it. So those other parents can be artist fathers, it can be artists who don't identify by the term mother. But it also, as you've said before, it extends to all of us working in the creative industries to an extent. Obviously, there are people that have really strong feelings on either side of this about using the term mother, because if you don't use the term mother, it makes all of that unpaid female labor going back generations invisible. And it doesn't acknowledge the fact there's still a gender care gap. There are also other people that feel really strongly that it should be parents. They might be people who are non-binary or people who think that if we use the term mother, then we perpetuate the fact that this is a women's issue. And in fact, it should be a societal issue. And I do discuss that a bit in the book. I wanted to keep the term mother in the title because I think there are lots of people for whom mother is a really, really important term and it's a culturally really important role. I wanted to make it welcoming to people who have strong feelings in both directions, if that makes sense. 
Yeah. And I mean, in the beginning of the book, you really do outline the sort of exclusion of women that began, you know, with the beginnings of modern art in the art schools and how this kind of intersected with motherhood. So it's an important point of departure, certainly. I wanted to turn to talk about some of the case studies that you touch on that do make space for all these very diverse positions and diverse experiences of motherhood and parent giving. You spoke about mother house studios in London, and this struck me as a potentially replicatable model. Could you speak a bit about these residencies and studio setups that you encountered in your research? Yeah, absolutely. This really kind of goes back actually to the chat we were having about artists having very, very different needs and very different approaches. So this mother house studios was established in London by an organisation called Procreate Project, which was founded by Diana Gravina. She's a really important force in the British art world in this field. So she's also started the Mother Art Prize and Procreate Project is also a commissioning body. And the Mother House Studio is a project. She's been working on it about seven years, looking at how you might have some kind of integrated childcare studio set up. And she says that it really took a kind of, almost like a personal revelation for her to get over this thing that we're taught in our culture that you can't make art and be a parent in the same space. So Motherhouse Studios is a classic kind of warehouse studio type setup, post-industrial building on the outskirts of London in Catford. And in the middle of the space, there is a very, very large play area. Essentially, it's a children's area and it's got all kinds of Montessori kind of play set up in it. So it's got kind of pits with stones in, it's got moss on the walls, it's got a teepee, it's got a reading section, it's got big industrial spools that you can use as craft tables and this kind of thing. And there's also a facilitator in there who reads books of the kids and kind of facilitates craft activities. And there's no door on this space. It's a kind of walled space with a kind of open doorway. And then wrapped around that space in an L shape, there are about a dozen studio tables. And so the artist parents work at the studio tables and they sometimes also come into the play space and kind of work at the little tables they come in and they'll breastfeed or they'll change one of the kids. And the studio space kind of has a hot desking membership set up. So I think most of the parents that use the space come in for like two, two and a half days a week. So they pay a kind of membership for it. And there's community that's grown up around that. So when I was there, people kind of were sitting in the kitchen, sharing lunch together. And most of them come from the neighborhood in Catford, quite close to the studio, so that it's not a massive trip. And there are kind of quiet spaces in there where their kids can kind of lie down and have a nap. And the idea is that if you're not forcibly separating the child from the parent, that actually both can relax into doing their own stuff, whether that's playing as a child or making art as the parent. And absolutely Procreate projects are really, really keen to put together a toolkit so that other communities can replicate this kind of model in their own community. And I think the idea is very much that it's a community-based setup, that it should be in a neighbourhood so that people can get to it quickly. Because as we all know, when you're a parent, just that little tiny bit of time that it takes to travel across time to get to a studio can really interfere with your kind of parenting schedule and it makes it a lot more difficult to have time to work. So the idea is this will be a kind of replicable model that people can pick up all over the UK and indeed all over the world. It's not going to work for every kind of artist. If you've got a big, messy practice, if you're an oil painter, if you're a large scale sculptor, if you're doing welding or spray painting or something, that this probably isn't going to work for you. But for lots of people, this is going to be a really game changing offer of a way to work in a sustainable way with your child or children. Mm. It's so encouraging to hear about models like that. And the artist mother in residency was another model that I thought was quite interesting for those who maybe are remote or do have practices that maybe aren't conducive to this kind of setup. Could you speak a little bit about that program or that toolkit? Sure. So, I mean, this really is very much a toolkit. It's very hands-off at this point. So this was started by Lenka Clayton, and it's called the Artist Residency in Motherhood. And before she became a parent, Lenka Clayton participated in lots of residencies. She found them really important to her practice, and she found them to be like a really important way to foster new areas of practice and to do research and to kind of engage in big projects. And once she became a parent, she really kind of missed that process, but it was really hard for her to engage in a residency program because I guess she was very much like a kind of hands-on primary caregiver. And she was working from home, but she found it really difficult to assign herself the time and to get serious about engaging in projects. So she came up with this idea of the artist residency on motherhood, which is essentially a residency program that you do at home. 
the point is that you take yourself seriously. And so she applied for a grant to do this residency at home. And from that grant, she assigned herself mentors. She assigned herself objectives. She came up with a kind of manifesto of what she wanted to produce in it. She made business cards. She made a vinyl to put in her window. And from that budget, she also assigned herself a certain amount of childcare each week. And it became incredibly fruitful. And she made quite a considerable body of work. There's works that she made during her artist residency in motherhood that have ended up in institutional collections in the US. I think one's in the Crystal Bridges Museum, which I think is objects that I found in my child's mouth. Essentially, she made this as a toolkit that you can download. So you just go to the website, which I think is literally artist residency in motherhood, and you email your set of objectives into this kind of portal. And it sends it back to you in a certificate form. So that's almost like the contract that you've made with yourself of stuff that you want to do on this residency. And you can invite people to become mentors for you. And you can create, let's say, a kind of structure in which you work. And it's really helped people. And it's something that's happened all over the world. So the artist I interviewed had just done it at that point, Chloe Marston. She's based in New Zealand. So it's become a real global phenomenon. I think it's literally thousands of people now have done it. And I think for people that were feeling quite lost and purposeless and like they couldn't kind of get into the groove of making work at home, it's been quite transformative. Yeah, well, what has also been transformative was reading your book. I really want to commend you for writing a book that really opens up all of these problems, but is not pessimistic and really offers tangible solutions. Before we jump off, to quote Marilyn Minter, which you quoted in the book, to move beyond the sort of art world of young bad boys and old ladies into a place that is really inclusive for everyone. Are you encouraged? Do you feel hopeful that this is something that we can arrive at? The absolutely key thing, my dearest hope for this book, is to move this conversation out beyond the artist mother echo chamber, which is actually why it's incredibly important. And I'm really so happy to be talking about this on Artnet because I've done quite a few podcasts, but most of them have been really for the kind of artist mother community. So to get this conversation out there in the art world mainstream on a really widely read platform like this, you know, means a lot. And it's what is going to start making a big difference, I hope, with this book. You know, it's wonderful that there are lots of artist mothers out there that have responded in the most generous and supportive way to the book being launched. But if we can start to get the book read by people who are not artist mothers that don't necessarily think they have a dog in the fight that actually haven't given any thought to this as an issue. That's when the changes are really going to happen. Definitely. And lest we forget that mothers are raising the next generation. And so this is really about societal health at large and it behooves everyone to care about it. Thank you so much, Hedy, for joining us today. And I wish you all the best with the next weeks of launching your book. Thank you so much, Kate. It's been wonderful chatting to you. That's it for this week's episode. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili, Caroline Goldstein, and Tim Schneider. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.